Uncle John. Let's use the UFO UAP yes. special access programs. First of all, the people think that, you know, you're seeing all of this posturing that's going on. You know, we've got this task force and we've, you know, we're having uh, congressional committee meetings and all that stuff. So it's all going to be revealed to us. No, it's not. You're not going to learn anything that hasn't already been said, you know, 55,000 times before and just rewarming it. You're not going to learn anything. And the reason you're not is because from the top down, and I'm talking about the the current occupant of the White House, special access programs, particularly the ones that go, that are not commanded or led by uh, military personnel, they are part of contract organizations that build, you know, these massive things, it could be McDonnell Douglas, it could be Raytheon, it could be, you name it, right? And they have special access programs. They have classified places that are top secret. They are not commanded by military, but they work under government contract. Uh, they have their own special access programs there. And let's assume that that happens to be one of the places where you might, people want to say like Area 51. Well, Area 51 uh, is not all military. Uh, there are government contractors that are out there. Uh, those governor contractors are affiliated with, you know, part they, that is their classified, you know, development portion of that particular, they may be building the next uh, airliner, but they are also building the next space war craft out there and testing it. Those special access programs, there is no legal precedent. The Justice Department has absolutely no authority over them. Uh, the President of the United States, who is considered, by the way, uh, in these special access programs to be a transient occupant of the White House. They have no beholding to that individual, which is why there's never been a president in the United States that would stand up and say, I'm going to rip the lid off of this. And if there's any alien bodies, I'm going to have them drag them out and we're all going to get to see them. And we're going to look at a, a spaceship. In fact, I'm going to go sit at the controls, you know, as president and do that. Yeah. Nothing could be more laughable. Not going to happen. Not ever. Wouldn't matter if he demanded it. Wouldn't matter if he stood up in the next State of the Union address and slammed his hands on the podium. They would just go like, mm, yeah, okay. They would give him what they wanted to give him. And if he got upset and wanted a, something different, they would turn around, uh, restructure exactly the same information and deliver it again to their chief of staff, to his chief of staff. And they go, this is it. This is what you get. Now, I know Americans think like, oh, well, that can't be. Oh, yes, it can. It's because you don't understand how the intel community, you know, since its inception. So we relied on the military to do it, but we were not good at it. So OSS learned from, you know, from the British Secret Service. And from there, uh, it becomes, you know, the CIA post-1945, post the war. And while uh, Truman tried to keep it very small, it did what, what intel communities do. Uh, they invent reinvent themselves and it's mission creep. They become bigger, you know, bigger budgets, bigger everything. And so now you see the CIA as it is. They don't sit down and brief the president of the United States on everything that they're doing. If they did that, it would no longer be secret. It would no longer be classified. So special access programs are exactly that. They are cells of knowledge and expertise in research or collection, or it could be everything from weaponry to aircraft to you name it, to collection capabilities, to analytical capabilities. Special access programs exist for one reason, and that is to compartmentalize and to protect the information that is contained, gathered, analyzed, created within that special access program. This UAP UFO thing, First of all, the 92 to 98% of what you're seeing is stuff we've made in support of, we've made in support of the, we've made, the Russians have made, the Chinese have made in support of the, of the space war, which began in December of 1945. Mm -hmm. That point right there seems to be the catalyst, uh, the seed and point with which a lot of stuff changed within that whole UFO and UAP thing. Uh, and I don't know what happened before that, uh, I, you know, or what, what was going on before that and why things shifted at such a, what seems rapid. Yeah. Everything has changed. Was it, are we going to just go with Roswell? Okay. Roswell. Thanks. And that was 47. Uh, but yeah, it, you know, there's there a couple of answers to that one. 
is there was a former, he, well, he was a four-star general. He was the chief of staff of the army. Remember the army air corps was what later in 47, 48 became the U S became the U S air force. But in 45, it was the army air corps and this four-star general chief of staff of the army uh, got together uh, in December 45 with a physicist and the staff, the army staff supported this particular general in this observation. It's very Clausewitz. The nature of war will never change. Only the way in which war is fought uh, and uh, will change and meaning, you know, and the places and how it's fought. And their understanding at that point was the next war will be a war in the dimension of space. And so they understood very clearly that they were in a space war with Russia or the Soviet Union at that time and China, not China. I mean, China in 45 was still eating dirt soup. They were still under their own revolution or, or that new, new revolution with Mao. I don't think Chiang Kai-shek, I don't know if the revolution with Chiang Kai-shek and Mao were still, was still ongoing. They were not a contender in that, in that war at that particular time. This general and this physicist develop a 50 year plan with which they were going to build and implement the space war, not the space race, the space war. And in 45, that happened. And there is an ESRI uh, website. I think it's ESRI.com. You'll just have to look it up. And on it, you can see they have posted in a really cool graphic uh, that begins in 1900 and goes all the way up to I think it's 2018, 2013, 2018. And you can look at this graphic and just bear in mind what I just told you, that the space war started in December of 1945. When that declaration was made by this general and they developed a 50-year plan. When you look at this ERSRI graphic and you watch the slider go from 1900, you will see nothing up until 1945. And then all of a sudden, you start to see appearances, right? UFO sightings, sightings that have been reported, and, and there they are. And watch this thing as the slider moves past 47, 48, 49, 50, as it keeps on going up to current date, how it's just illuminated. It looks like somebody turned the lights out in the universe, and you're looking at the United States with all the lights on, <laughs> but you're, they're all reports. They're all known reported sightings, not confirmed, but reported sightings. Watch what happens there. It, it goes to the whole idea that what happened in the space war and the massive budget that was being produced there for that through the Air Force was to build space weaponry. And they were, this starts in 1945. I think it was by 1958, a huge budget proposal was put forward to Department of Defense where they said, we need we have to start developing space weapons, hypersonic space vehicles. We need a space station. Uh, you know, we need all these different things. And we're not talking about like a space station for research. We're talking about a space station for intelligence collection by the United States Air Force at that point. That all existed. I mean, I went to the Classified Air Force Museum in uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in, up in Ohio. And uh, they had a Classified Air Force Museum there. And I had a, a, a good friend of mine. Uh, Colonel, still active there, took me into it. Uh, and uh, I saw Air Force astronaut uniforms there. Now, don't confuse that with astronaut uniforms for NASA. That's not what that was. NASA got formed in 58 as well by Eisenhower. And then Kennedy kicked it in the butt in 61 and is the guy that went before Congress and listed Kennedy goes before Congress. I think it was 61 and his deliverance to Congress was called urgent national needs. And he goes before Congress and asks under that title of his presentation for $9 billion, which was a hell of a lot of money back then. And the $9 billion are given 7 billion go to the space war, 2 billion go to NASA because NASA was created that was the space race. It was created to be for humanity and all humanity and exploration, right? It was, it was exploration and discovery and 
those kinds of words were used to describe what they were going to do. In fact, Kennedy himself used those words in the in descriptions of what NASA was going to be doing. So there was some exchange and interplay between NASA and the space war, but the space war was the dominant behind the scenes effort to create our ability to control the dimension of space so that the Soviet did not take it. And later on uh, in the 70s, so that China could not occupy it. And that war goes on to this very day. Thank you.